So hi everyone, um, I'm Dr. Rebecca Randall and um, before I begin the presentation I'd just like to say a big thank you to ACSM for the invitation to present to you today on the health and performance considerations for female soccer players. So the interest in female soccer has grown exponentially. Um, over the last 10 years, um, participation rates have increased by a third. And the Federation of International Football, or FIFA, is committed to increase the number of female soccer players from 13.3 million in 2019 to 60 billion by 2026. But it's not only the um, increase in participation rate um, that we have experienced over the last few years. Um, we're definitely making our mark on the world of sport in football. And this has also been shown by um, how many people have been viewing the recent World Cup. So over one billion people watched the Women's World Cup in 2019, with 80.2 million people watching the USA and Netherlands final. So this background information is just to say that there's such a big increase in participation rates and viewing rates. Although what you will find throughout the rest of my presentation is that the science is lacking. And so there's this disconnect between the athletes and what people are doing and the science that we currently have. So this is a perfect opportunity to talk about where the science is currently, as well as highlight the gaps in the literature and what maybe some of us can do on this webinar today to help fill those gaps. So um, as the title of um, my presentation said, I'm gonna talk about the health and performance considerations of female soccer players, but I've split the presentation into three different sections. So firstly, I'm going to talk about the physical demands of female soccer, then talk about the health considerations for female athletes and female soccer players, as well as the current nutrition recommendations for female athletes. Now this all together um, will help improve the performance of our players. So starting with the physical demands of soccer, the total distance covered by um, a female during a soccer game is an indication of the volume of activity. And although there will be variation between players because different positions will run further than others, um, the team tactics might dictate how many um, kilometers or miles a player will run. But on average, elite players will generally cover 10 kilometers during a game or 6.2 miles. However, this just shows us the average distance and it's actually the number of activity which is completed at maximal running speeds that is key because this type of activity is related to team success. So distance covered in high intense, by high intensity actions is normally determined by applying specific speed thresholds to the player's movements and then calculating the amount of activity that exceeds that threshold. However, there are some discrepancies in the specific definitions of repeated sprint activity. And the majority of papers, as you can see on this slide, use um, a broad classification that includes multiple high running speeds and sprinting bouts. Um, so you can see that here, if I just get the pointer that these studies all used um, different ranges or broad classifications to determine what they say is high speed running. Um, there's also large variation in high speed running between um, soccer games, as you can see here. And this is a result of the environmental conditions, the playing position, 
their level of play and other contextual factors, including the quality of the opposition, the play and surface and team tactics. However, um, focusing solely on high speed running neglects the other soccer activities, which are also important in influencing the physical demands of a game. Now, the introduction of micro electrical mechanical system devices into the sport has enabled other movements to be more accurately described, such as decelerations, the change of direction jumping, kicking and tackling. And these actions will all be associated with a physiological cost. Although there's few studies that are currently available in female soccer players that describe either the extent or the demands that are associated with these actions. So knowing the physical demands of um, female soccer players, it improves our understanding of the potential health and nutritional considerations because we'll know how much um, physical demand is put on the player's body. And then due to that, we're able to determine what um, beneficial or negative health consequences might occur with that, but also what um, nutrition recommendations these players might need. Um, but today we do need more research. So that was the first section, just a really quick overview of the physical demands. And now I want to talk about the health considerations for female soccer players. So women are unique um, and so cuts consequently that comes with um, unique health considerations. So, First of all, women are unique in that we have different hormones, as different sex hormones um, compared to men, and also we have a menstrual cycle. Bone health um, is um, extremely important for women and women are at more risk of um, impaired bone health. So something that we need to consider when working with female athletes. And also energy availability, um, not, uh, not just solely um, related to women, um, men can also have low energy availability, but it's often that if athletes or female athletes um, play in a sport where um, aesthetics is key, or if they um, have certain um, or follow a certain diet that might reduce their energy intake, then low energy availability can occur. And um, that's something that we need to address when working with female athletes, um, regardless of the sport they play. So this section is gonna look in um, slightly more detail at the following three things. So the hormones and the menstrual cycle, um, a very small um, section on bone health, and then also a section on energy availability. So um, probably not, nothing new on this slide, um, especially with females, um, but um, every female will have, or hopefully every female will have a menstrual cycle if they're, um, if they're healthy. There's four stages of menstruation. So the first stage is the bleed, um, followed by the follicular phase where estrogen is low and that's um, shown in the yellow line, which does increase towards the end of the follicular phase and pedestrian is low and that's the purple line that you can see here. Um, then we have ovulation and um, so that's the, the peak of ovulation and we have this um, increase in the um, luteal um, hormone. And then we have the luteal phase where estrogen and pedestrian are high. Now, the primary role of these hormones is to support reproduction. However, the fluctuating levels of hormones, and um, so specifically estrogen and progesterone, also have an impact on cardiovascular, respiratory and uh, metabolic function, as well as our musculoskeletal system. So does um, menstruation affect performance? Um, so 
in women, exercise performance may be um, reduced by a trivial amount during that very early follicular phase compared to other phases. And this was recently described in um, a meta-analysis by McNulty et al. Although I should point out here that by trivial, that means a really, really small amount. So in some females, in some women, it might not have any impact on performance, whereas in some women, it may have a very small impact and reduce their performance. So that meta-analysis was looking at um, female athletes in general, um, but there has been a study which has been conducted specifically in uh, soccer players. So this study was published in 2020 by Julianne et al. And it showed that very high intensity running distance during matches over a four month period was um, significantly greater in the luteal phase compared to the follicular phase. Although should note that there was large measurement variance um, across the matches. Um, other studies that have looked into this have actually found um, no effect of menstrual cycle on power and um, repeated sprint ability and endurance. And um, with most of the research that has been done in this area, um, participants were studied at a group level to look at differences between the, the two phases. But we should always acknowledge that there might be effects um, across the menstrual cycle, which are highly individualized. And by that, I mean, for one person, they might have um, impaired in performance um, in one phase of the menstrual cycle compared to the other. And then there might be another soccer player or another female athlete that will have no impairment in performance between the phases of the menstrual cycle. Um, the menstrual cycle, um, and to a similar point of what I was just saying, um, might not affect performance. And although this example is not soccer um, specific, this athlete on the left, if you are not aware of her, is Paula Radcliffe. And she um, set the women's world marathon record in 2003, which she held for 16 years while she was on her period. So she completed the marathon, set a world record time whilst, um, while she was menstruating. So at the moment, I think um, if we just summarize that section, um, we're not clear as to whether Ment the menstrual cycle has an impact on performance. And if we're working with female athletes and female soccer players, we should take it as an individualized approach. And we should work with our athletes to see if they're experiencing any side effects on their menstrual cycle, which could potentially um, impact their performance. So moving on to bone health. So up to 30% of peak bone mass is acquired during three, three years of puberty. And active girls increase their bone mineral content by 17% compared to non-active girls. And diets which are sufficient um, in levels of calcium and vitamin D should be considered for female athlete bone health. However, there are some specific challenges that female athletes and soccer players might encounter which relate to bone health. And these are energy availability, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail, but there's a clear link between continuous and long-term low energy availability and the detrimental effects that it can have on bone health. So um, also we need to ensure that um, female athletes are getting enough carbohydrate as low carbohydrate diets can also lead to low energy availability. And then back to my previous point, if there is chronic low energy availability that can have negative effects on bone health. 
Um, so we need to make sure that our players are eating enough and then we can make sure that their um, bones are healthy and that they have um, healthy bone health and also that their um, bones grow, especially in that early period um, during puberty. And I've already mentioned it, but energy availability is extremely important in both males and females. Um, but something that we should be aware of when working with um, female athletes, as well as female soccer players. So I'm going to spend a bit of an extended time talking about energy availability and the research that is currently available in or currently been um, executed in female soccer players. So to just take a step back and explain what energy availability is, it's the amount of energy that's available to support all bodily functions after subtracting the amount of energy that's been expended for exercise. And it's always expressed relative to fat-free mass. So the body requires energy to support a number of function, functions such as thermoregulation, reproduction, growth, and cell maintenance. And if there isn't enough energy to, um, to be able to sustain the function of those of these um, physiological um, requirements, then there might be um, detriments to health and also um, some of these physiological processes um, will um, reduce. So what determines um, insufficient energy availability? Well, it can arise from an increase in energy expenditure. So if our female athletes are suddenly training more, and then if they're not eating anymore, then they are going to have insufficient energy. And these two things can also occur in isolation. So female athletes might increase their energy intake or they might decrease their, oh, sorry, increase their energy expenditure, sorry, or they might decrease their energy intake. And both of these things will result in low energy availability. Um, but low energy availability can also arise if both of these things occur. So it could be incidences where athletes will have an increase in energy expenditure, but they won't increase their energy intake to match that increase in energy expenditure. Therefore, um, it will result in low energy availability. So why do we care about this? Well, if there's periods of low energy availability, which are sustained, many detrimental health consequences can occur in females. And they're all shown on this slide here, but just to, uh, to talk about some in a bit more detail, um, menstrual function can be um, disturbed and that can result in a loss of menstrual cycle, or as we call it, amenorrhea. I've already alluded to this, but um, over chronic periods of low energy availability, bone health may also be compromised. And in really extreme cases, and um, this can result in osteoporosis. Um, another thing that we should be aware of is that if low energy availability is sustained, then growth and development is reduced and that can um, result in a reduction in protein synthesis. Something which is extremely important um, when working with athletes, we want to make sure that they're maintaining their muscle mass. And then just some other things that you can see on this slide here. So it might have um, psychological impacts. Um, gastrointestinal um, distress can um, increase if there's periods of chronic um, low energy availability and immunity might also be impaired. Well, not only does it have um, health implications, but chronic low energy availability can also be detrimental for many aspects of athletic performance. And something that um, 
we're always trying to reduce in athletes of any sport is a reduction in injury risk. And so if players have um, these sustained periods of low energy availability, they put themselves at an increased risk of um, injury. And then you can see here that there's um, some other detrimental effects on performance. If players or athletes are undergoing or um, sustaining low periods of energy availability, such as a decrease in muscle strength, a decrease in exercise performance, um, athletes are unable to store as much glycogen in their muscles, so they're not, they won't be able to sustain that high intensity exercise, um, and then an impairment of judgment and coordination. And you can see here that all of these things are very specific to football players, soccer players, sorry. And so we need to make sure that um, our soccer players have appropriate energy so that they can sustain performance and perform optimally. Now, globally, and as I talked about um, very early on in this presentation, there is an increase in female soccer participation. And um, female soccer is becoming more and more professionalized globally. And as a result, um, it's resulting in a higher training volume and competition demand, which could place these athletes at higher risk of low energy availability. But to date, there is a poor understanding of whether this actually is a concern for this group of athletes. Um, because there is um, a lack of research, but I'm going to talk about some of the research which is currently available. Um, before I do, just want to um, talk about how energy availability is calculated. And you can see that at the top of the screen here. So we have to do a measure of energy intake, whether that's through um, 24 hour dietary recalls or um, food diaries. And then we also have to get a measure of the energy expenditure during exercise. Um, and then once we have those two measurements, we subtract energy intake from energy expenditure, and then we divide the number by fat-free mass. So we have to use um, a measure of body composition to get the fat-free mass of the players so that we can divide the um, calculation by um, that number. And then once energy availability has been calculated, there's um, a classification criteria, although um, it is largely under debate as to what the cutoffs should be. Um, but for the majority of the studies, if energy availability is more than 45 um, kilocals per kilogram of fat-free mass, then we would put those players into optimal energy availability. If it's calculated at between 30 to 44 kilocals of um, fat-free mass, then um, those athletes and players would be at reduced energy availability. And then if um, it's calculated at less than 30 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass, then a flag would be raised and those players would be classified as having low energy availability. So what um, data is, is out there? So um, as I just said, for professional female foot, uh, soccer players, the high um, training amount and the competition demands during the competitive season might place them at risk of low energy availability and the aforementioned um, consequences that I've previously discussed. Now, in this study by Reed and colleagues, they revealed that 33% of players were in low energy availability during the mid-season. However, these measurements were collected for um, just three consecutive days, and the data was only reported as a mean, which limits the interpretation. Um, and then what we don't get from this data is if there's any differences in energy availability between training days that might differ in duration and intensity, um, match days and also rest days. 
So more recently in this study by um, Moss et al, um, which I was able to be a part of, we um, looked or we investigated um, energy availability in female soccer players. These were professional female players which played in the top league in England over a five day period. And over that five day period, we were able um, to get measurements of energy um, availability on a heavy training day where they had a soccer practice in the morning and then a weight session in the afternoon on um, two rest days and the data for that when I present it has been um, combined together on a light training day where they just did soccer practice in the morning and then on a match day. And then to measure energy intake, we asked all the players to um, do a food diary over this five day period. And we also got them to send pictures of their meals to us um, via WhatsApp so that we could um, cross reference the pictures to the information that they had provided us. And then to get a measure of energy expenditure, um, we used um, a GPS system here. And then for the um, weight session, we were able to look at the metabolic equivalents um, and to get a calculated um, number of energy expenditure. So looking at the data, firstly, when we grouped all of that information over the five day period, so not looking at what the players were doing on the specific days, we found that 54% of our players had reduced energy availability and 23% of players had um, low energy availability. And then we had 23% of so the same amount that were in optimal energy availability. When we separate our data by the training load, 50 8% and 62% of our players had low energy availability on the heavy training day, so when they were doing two sessions, and also on the match day. 38% of the players had low energy availability on the light training day. And then not surprisingly um, to us, um, no players were classified as having low energy availability on the rest day, although we did have um, a high proportion of players that had reduced the energy availability. So to, to summarize um, that result, um, on average, um, 10 out of our 13 players had suboptimal energy availability to support bodily functions um, over that five day period to meet the demands of their exercise. So what we need to do from, from looking at this data is to ensure that players are ingesting enough calories to meet their energy demands to prevent long term health and performance issues. Now, I'm going to show um, some more of that data from that study um, in this next section, because I think it ties in nicely um, with what I'm going to talk about. So for the final part of this presentation, I'm going to um, discuss the nutrition for female soccer players. And firstly, I'm looking at um, how much food should female players eat. Um, in a, a recent review paper, which um, we recently published, we looked at um, the data that was currently available for female soccer players and to get enough energy to meet the demands of the sport and for daily living on a match day um, players should be consuming around 2400 kilocalories and what does that look like if we set it out um, at a day? It would be roughly 500 calories um, at breakfast and another 500 calories at lunch. Dinner, um, maybe slightly more, especially if that's following um, the match. We might need to make sure that our players are having snacks. 
so around 300 calories um, for the snacks allocated to snacks and then also to highlight that players especially when they're playing a match should be ingesting um, some kind of calories um, during the, the match play. And what's um, especially important um, as, um, during matches is carbohydrate, as they are the carbohydrates are the primary fuel for high intensity muscle contraction. And as I alluded to very early on in the presentation, it's those high intensity um, periods of play that will determine the success of the team. And the next slide just talks about this in a lot more detail and going into why um, carbohydrates are essential. Um, this is because carbohydrate can maintain short um, energy bursts. It can, it can maintain um, muscle glycogen stores, um, maintain blood glucose, which is important for attention and decision making which is um, very key, which is key for all players going from your, your forwards right to your goalkeeper and will maintain um, muscle glycogen over time. So that means that even towards the end of the match, players are still able to perform those high intensity and bouts of exercise. So how much um, carbohydrate should our female soccer players be consuming? Well, that all depends on the um, training or the activity that our female soccer players are undertaking. So if they are um, just doing some light intensity or low intensity training, or even on a rest day, then the carbohydrate recommendations will be um, between three to five grams per kilogram of body mass. And for a 60 kilogram player, you're looking at around 180 to 300 grams of carbohydrate per day. Now, if um, our players are then increasing their activity and um, they're undergoing a moderate intensity training session or training for approximately an hour a day, then the carbohydrate recommendations will slightly increase to five to seven grams per kilogram of body mass. And you can see here what that would look like for a 60 kilogram player. And then um, what's also important and what we should pay particular attention to is how much um, carbohydrate is needed if our players are undergoing hard or high intensity training. So um, especially for a match, we need to ensure that players are ingesting between six to 10 grams per kilogram of body mass. And you can see here um, another example as to what that would look like for a 60 kilogram player. Now I said I was gonna talk more about um, that study by Moss et al. And this was the carbohydrate intake from the players that we tested on their heavy training day. And it was evident from our data that the players did not increase or periodize their carbohydrate. And that was particularly evident on their heavy training day on the, and the match day. So on the graph here, it shows them the carbohydrate intake um, for each individual player that we tested relative to their body weight. And this is just for their heavy training day. Now the dotted line here shows um, or represents just over three grams per kilogram of body mass of carbohydrate, which is a very minimal cutoff of what we would expect carbohydrate to be. We actually, just alluding back to my previous slide, would like to see carbohydrate intakes on a heavy training day at around six grams per kilogram body mass, or especially um, over five. Um, and it's very clear that you can, you can clearly see that only five players, or this player didn't nearly reached um, three grams per kilogram of body mass of carbohydrate, but we only had around five players that reached that very, um, that reached that minimal threshold. 
Um, again, this shows the carbohydrate intake, but for the match day, you can see that more players are in green and um, indicating that they reached that very minimal cutoff of three grams per kilogram. Um, but we do still see some players that are in that red zone. And as I just said, uh, we would ideally like to see more of our players um, reach this five or six grams per kilogram of body mass. So what our data from this study highlighted is that um, our female soccer players are not ingesting enough carbohydrate to meet the demands of the exercise, um, as well as the recommendations. Um, so that was um, talking about daily carbohydrate intake, um, but also um, carbohydrate intake should be ingested during exercise, especially if um, exercising for more than an hour. So when training lasts between one to two hours um, and it's of moderate to high intensity, our female soccer players should be ingesting 30 grams. Um, anything more than two hours, um, we're looking at them ingesting 60 grams per hour. And then any more than two and a half hours, um, the recommendation is to ingest up to 60 grams per hour. So for match play, um, lasting between um, maybe an hour to um, an hour and a half, 90 minutes, um, maybe longer if um, there's extra time, our female soccer players should be ingesting 30 to 60 grams per hour, and they can ingest um, carbohydrates in most forms, um, but making sure that they're rapidly oxidized sugars. So those sugars which are um, contained in sports drinks, in gels and in chews. Now, one thing that um, I should mention here is that there's no um, specific studies that have investigated carbohydrate ingestion on soccer performance in female players. So um, I guess one thing to say here is that this is a perfect opportunity um, to do um, a study looking at this. So the benefits of carbohydrate for um, athletes in general and female athletes, they are established and um, because consuming enough carbohydrate um, to fuel performance is key and um, recovery can be difficult if, the, if athletes, if female athletes are purposefully restricting energy. Um, some athletes um, might consume a low energy dense carbohydrates such as um, whole fruits and vegetables um, because of their high fiber content to help them feel, feel full. But consuming a low energy dense diet may result in female athletes um, consuming fewer calories needed to support the athlete's needs. So some research has suggested that this type of diet may be a contributing factor to low energy availability, which could result in some of those um, health and performance um, detrim uh, detrimental effects um, that's seen in some female athletes. Now, carbohydrates are also important because we need the energy um, from carbohydrate to also fuel our brain. It keeps us sharp, um, especially when playing um, soccer matches and we're having to react to the ball and to our opponents. Also helps us to keep us um, sharp, keeps our skills, uh, skills sharp throughout the game. And as mentioned previously, means that we can sustain those high intensity bouts of exercise. And there's no differences in the ability of females um, to store carbohydrate for, for fuel compared to males. So it's equally important for both sexes. Now, protein is also important for our female soccer players. And um, protein provides the building blocks for our bodies. It helps to repair um, muscle tissue, and this is especially important after exercise or um, if it's very high or hard intensity exercise, we need to make sure that our muscles are repaired as quick as possible so that we can go again, um, especially when there's uh, match congestion and we're playing a lot of matches throughout the week. 
we need to make sure that following that first match, muscles are repairing and um, whatever we can do to help them repair protein intake being one of those ways to help um, recovery so that we can go again for that match that may be later on in the week. One um, consideration and one thing to, to point out here is that vegetarian or vegan athletes um, should make sure that they are getting enough protein in their diets. So if you're working with any female soccer players that are following a vegetarian or vegan diet, um, make sure they speak to a, a registered dietitian or um, if you are one yourself, make sure that they're getting enough protein in their diet. Um, and also there's no differences um, to what we know yet if there are differences in the protein needs between young men and women. So what are the recommendations um, for protein? So for female athletes, the total daily protein recommendations are to ingest approximately 1.6 grams per kilogram per day of protein. Or that might look at approximately 0.3 grams per kilogram of protein at each meal. And what should that look like um, for female soccer players and what should they be eating after practice or after a match? So for a 60 kilogram player, if we go by this principle and the recommendation of ingesting 0.3 grams per kilogram of protein post-exercise, and um, they should be ingesting approximately 18 grams of protein. And then for a 70 kilogram player, that would um, equate to 21 grams of protein. So for our 60 kilogram player, this might look like um, uh, having two eggs maybe with a piece of toast to make sure that we get some carbohydrate as well, um, and also a yogurt, or maybe um, an, another recommendation might be to have um, some peanut butter on toast. For our 70 kilogram player who needs um, slightly more protein, um, this could be um, a small amount of cheese, um, maybe again in a sandwich or a bagel so that we're getting some carbohydrate um, and ingested with some milk, which is also good for hydration. Or um, maybe this athlete might be recommended some lean meats such as um, chicken or turkey. Now again, um, and this is uh, one of the, the final slides before I just go into the conclusion, um, again, looking at this data from the Moss et al study that looked at energy availability in the female soccer players. From our energy intake data, we were able to um, calculate how much protein our female soccer players were ingesting on each of the days. And you can see here that they reached that um, recommendation of 1.6 grams per kilogram per day on each of the days. Um, so this is the mean for all days, but they also reached that recommendation um, for the heavy, light, match and rest days. And then again, just highlighting here that the, the carbohydrate and how much lower that was and how it didn't reach that recommendation. So they weren't, um, they weren't able to periodize their carbohydrate intake um, to reflect the amount of um, energy that they were expend expending on the different days. So I guess that was kind of a, a whistle stop tour of um, the considerations for female soccer players um, and this I'm just just put together to, to summarize what I've talked to today so um, as a practitioner or if you're going to work with female soccer players understanding the physical demands is key to be able to um, assess and keep track of what any health considerations might be needed for the players and then also knowing what the nutrition recommendations might be. And these three things together will help um, improve and maintain the performance of the players. So I would like to just stop there. I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation and I welcome any questions.